Yeah, it's working. Okay, so um, hi, I'm Arnold Tavanel from Bitcrace. And I will be talking about the local positioning system. That's a local positioning system we've been developing for the last uh, one year and a half. So uh, Bitcrace is a company we created to, um, uh, to support CrazyFly quadcopter. That's a project we did as a hobby originally, and that finally we started selling. So we need company to sell it. And uh, from the origin, we did that uh, as an open source quadcopter. And when finally we could uh, work full time for a company, we made CrazyFly 2.0, which was, yes, uh, fully designed as a um, flying development platform. So we did that by putting a CPU that was way too powerful in it uh, just to fly. And we made an expansion port, which we call deck expansion port. Since Arduino, you need to give a name to your expansion port, apparently. So ours are decks. And this was intended to allow, allow people to add their own software, add their own art hardware, and use that yeah, as a development platform, as a flying platform to do more with. And, but s since we started making quadcopter, we always wanted to make them fly autonomously. I mean, it's quite easy to, or it's quite reachable to make a quadcopter that you fly manually, but it's not that easy to make it fly autom uh, automatically because the sensor it has is a gyroscope accelerometer, so it will basically be able to get its orientation in here. And with the orientation and the fact that we, uh, we have thrust going down, so we go up, we can move around. But if you would ask it to uh, stay stable, it won't. It will just drift away eventually. Uh, so to fly autonomously, we've tried many things, many hacks. Uh, very early with uh, yeah, up-facing camera, just looking, uh, open CV detecting the copter over the white ceiling. The size of the copter gives us the uh, distance, and x, y we get by its position in, uh, in the picture. Did, this didn't work really well because we did not have the stabilization software to, to actually be stable above the camera. Or actually, we, we did not have them really good, so it tends to go away from the camera field very quickly. So it's actually very frustrating to, uh, to work with that. Uh, we have a couple of tried with Kinect camera. Those are really nice because they are 3D cameras. They can give you X, Y with, with, uh, with the picture. It can also tell you how far the object is. Uh, so, yeah, we have one generation of Kinect 1 and one with Kinect 2 that actually worked fairly well. We used that at Maker Fairs and we could fly uh, full battery time, but we're still uh, limited to the, to the field of view of the camera. And our software was still not so great, so it was still fairly unstable if you get some wind or these kind of things. Uh, thought we also had a try with a simple webcam looking at AR marker. Uh, this is things when you can yeah, put augmented reality um, objects on top of your image. So the library that does that are really great. They give you the position X, Y, Z, and orientation of the marker. Uh, this works great until there is sun. So uh, we have that as a maker fair. Morning, no problem. Afternoon, the sun coming to the copter and nothing is detected. So all that was pretty brittle. And our main problem was that uh, since we didn't have a proper uh, positioning system, we didn't have any excuse or any incentive to develop proper autonomous algorithm. Since we didn't have proper autonomous algorithm, none of these were working really great. Uh, and that kind of changed one and a half year ago when we discovered uh, this chip, the Descartes DV1000. It's an off-the-shelf ultra-headband radio. Uh, it is advertised as a radio chip that can range, so you can get the distance uh, using time of flight measurement between two radio chips. And that was great for us because then, I mean, this can be the base of a local positioning system. Uh, and it's also implementing a standard. So even though, as far as we know, that's the only chip we can source for this standard, there is hope that uh, all the manufacturer makes chip and we can be compatible with more hardware and we can choose our chips later. Uh, but so what, what do we call a local positioning system? So yeah, it's very simple. It's basically like GPS, but local. Uh, GPS will allow you to get an absolute position anywhere in the world, but it works really badly indoors. Uh, 
and that's where making a system that will allow you to get an absolute position indoors might be uh, very interesting. So what, what we basically want is that if we have our drone, we want to know that if we are here, our origin will be there. We want to know that we're one meter, one meter, one meter in the, in the room. Uh, that's what we are trying to reach. Uh, the reason you would like to do that, uh, what, one industrial reason or, yeah, one more common reason that is developed a lot lately is indoor navigation, but for people. So imagine you have a positioning system in a shopping mall or an airport. You will be able to make app that help people navigate and reach the gate more easily. Uh, asset tracking is a pretty big thing. So tracking assets in warehouse uh, is very expensive stuff for just uh, packages. But uh, what we're interested in as a big craze is uh, robotics. So that's what we're focusing in, a system for flying robotics or any kind of robotics, actually. So there is a system that exists already. There has been people using our, um, our quadcopter to do swarm research and autonomous flight and these kind of things. Uh, the most use is uh, motion capture systems. So that's the same system they use in movies for capturing the, the motion of an actor. So you have um, reflectors on joints and you will be able to find out how the skeleton is moving. But instead of that, we put uh, reflectors, there's these bolts here. On, on the platform, on the, on the quadcopter. And that works really good, really, really well. You get some millimeter precision even in a room big like that. But you will need, you will need the dozens of cameras for that and it costs a lot of money. So much that university usually shares this system. They buy one or two and they share it between labs. So uh, it's very impractical to do research when you, you have a limited resource. Uh, there's optical flow platforms that exist. The idea is that instead of putting camera around, you put camera on the copter to find out how the, how the world is moving around you. Well, um, yeah. And there is a couple of radio systems. Uh, we like radio system because it's less dependent to the lightning environment. Um, the, the most used or the most developed is a rec receive signal strength system. So that's what you have with this uh, Bluetooth low energy key fob you can buy to, to find your keys with your mobile phone. But basically what you will be able, be able to get is near or far. You will not be able to get a very accurate position. I know that uh, Cisco has a system to detect uh, computers if you have a, a lot of uh, Wi-Fi router. But that's the same thing. You will get in which room and roughly where in the room the computer is. That's not something very useful for um, flying robotic. Not precise enough. Uh, there's a couple of system with angle detection. Uh, either you detect the uh, angle of arri arrival. There was talk about that yesterday in the SDR room. It's pretty nice, complicated. Uh, and or you can also look at w where you are uh, um, in regard to the antenna that transmits. That's used a lot by planes. I mean, there's. Uh, basically, you have a rotating antenna and you will find out where you are uh, regarding the antenna. Uh, so those could be used to, to locate where you are, knowing the angle. And finally, there is time of flight solution, which is what we've been using. Um, there you just measure the time it takes for the radio signal to go from the transmitter to the receiver. And knowing the time, you will know the distance because you know speed of light. And that will allow you to get uh, your position. Uh, though this requires pretty wide bandwidth to be uh, uh, to work properly with multipath. So, yeah, what is ultra wide band? In more conventional radio, what you're sending is a narrow band signal. So you're basically sending a sinus, and you're modulating some data around the sinus. And what you will get is a, a pretty narrow. Uh, band in the frequency domain with pretty narrow bandwidth and fairly high power. Uh, what we do in ultra band instead is that instead of sending data about modulating sinus, we send pulses, very short pulses. Uh, this will result in a very wide bandwidth um, and then we can keep the power low because the, um, 
the amount, the complete amount of power might be similar, but here we have 20 dBm, and here we have minus 41 dBm, uh, they call per megahertz. So we have really low power. Uh, this radio actually works below what normal radio consider noise. So uh, they are legal by working where you are allowed to transmit noise when you have a uh, conventional radio or narrowband radio. That can be very interesting to do timing, to time the arrival of the packet because you have a short pulse to detect. Though with narrowband, you could also detect when the, the sinus crosses zero. You could detect the phase and you could get fairly uh, accurate timing like uh, with that as well. But this behaves really badly with multipath. So multipath is when radio signal is transmitted from, uh, yeah, from transmitter to receiver. You will have a lot of reflective surfaces all around, uh, windows, wall, everything's, okay. a lot of things are reflective to radio. So when you receive, you will receive what we call direct path, which is uh, the fastest way from the, between the two antennas, but there will be also secondary path that will be the signal that have bounced, bounced around. Uh, this will be later, they will arrive later, and so they will be delayed a little bit. In case of narrow band, if we simplify that, saying it's a sinus, uh, you will get some of sinuses uh, with same frequency, and that will give you a sinus with same frequency. Only problem is that amplitude is modified and the phase is modified. So if you want to detect the phase to get the timing, you're out. Uh, ultra wide band, uh, since you send very short pulses, if you're lucky enough that your multipaths are not too close, you, you will basically receive a couple of paths. So you will be able to see the first path and you will be also able to see the secondary paths, path. Uh, there is a pretty cool thing actually that's not related to timing, but that a normal radio will be affected uh, negatively by multipath. That would be a problem usually that we try to solve. For example, Wi-Fi routers sorry, will have multiple antenna to deal with that among other things. Uh, in uh, ultra -right band, the radio will be able to use the energy of the, the other path. So ultra -right band will work better in a corridor or in a closed environment for transmitting packet because we'll be able to use energy of all the signal that bounced around, not only the one that uh, went directly to the antenna. And so uh, the way that's um, transmitted sorry, is uh, similar to a conventional radio packet, you have a preamble. So uh, when you have a re radio system, you usually start with a preamble. So it's a sequence that, re sequence that repeats itself, usually one zero, one zero, one zero, and that allows to synchronize uh, the, the transmitter with the receiver to then get the data. Uh, the preamble in a tried band is a, a bit more complex. It's more like a, uh, a longer pseudo-random sequence. And what and it's very, very long, and it will allow the receiver to uh, do a cross-correlation between what it sees in the air and the, the wanted preamble. And out of that, you get what we call the impulse response of the channel. So you will get uh, the first path and the multiple, the other path. You will get how much energy of the signal you get over time. And then you can use that to synchronize yourself and to get how much energy you need at which time to decode the data part. And while in a normal radio, for example, the, the two megabit per second radio we use to communicate with Clarify normally, the preamble is one byte, and the packet can be 32 bytes. Uh, here, the preamble is like 150 microseconds when you have 10 microseconds of data. So it's really disproportionate. Um, yeah, and just to point out, this is a normal radio. It's not a specific thing. It transmits data. It's uh, based on IEEE 802.15.4, so it, it has a MAC header, and you can just uh, put data in. It's just that, as a side effect, you will be able to measure very exactly when the packet leaves the, the antenna of the transmitter and when it arrived at the antenna of the receiver. Uh, so internally, it looks a little bit like that. We took that from uh, debug regi registers of the radio. Uh, uh, that's over time, and each line here is the amount of energy that was received for one packet uh, over time, and that's multiple packets. 
uh, we've taken that to see the effect of uh, occlusion, non-line of sight. And here we've had someone that passed in the way. And this is one of the drawbacks uh, of this radio is that if, if you pass in the way, it will actually affect the timing. And it doesn't work so well with non-line of sight uh, situation. You will actually get an offset. Because, um, yeah, it kind of blurs. You can see that here there's a very high peak two times, uh, two times the arrival of the packet. We know exactly when to write. Here it's a bit more blurry, and the algorithm that searches for this peak will tend to get confused. So, uh, to wrap it up, we, we have a radio that's able to give us a very price, precise timing of when packets leave and arrive. Uh, they have 64 gigahertz timer, so it's about 5 millimeter precision in timing. Um, though it's specified for plus minus 10 centimeter of precision, uh, when you do ranging with it, that's due to the fact that yeah, timing will be affected by non-line of sight, by temperature, by receive power. There's a lot of things that can affect your precision. And, and yeah, it's very robust to multipass, which is very important if you want accurate uh, timing of the packet. So now that we have a, a radio capable of uh, measuring timestamp, we need to use it in such a way that we can do a local positioning system with it. Uh, common architecture will be to have anchors and tag. What we call anchors is uh, fixed radios that you place around the room and you measure the position. So we have a couple here. Uh, and just this morning we measured their position, so we have entered them. We know where they are in space. And the tag is a radio that's going to move around and that's going to want to know its position or we want to know it, the position of. And there is, we have at least, we have a couple of ways we can do this ranging now that we have this architecture and timing capability. The simplest is called two arranging. So we will just ping. So the tag sends packet to the anchor, the anchor answers. We remove the answer time and you get two times the time of flight. Divide by two, you get time of flight. Um, the only problem with that is that the tag and the anchor, the anchor runs different clock. They are not synchronized they will uh, drift towards each, each other. So if this uh, answer time is big, or even if it's small actually, you will get a very big error. Very, very, very quick you will have the error induced by the, the answer time here. Dominate the, the, the measurement. So uh, the way we deal with that is that we just add a third packet. So intuitively, we do the two arranging one, the ping one way, the ping the other way, and the error will be symmetrical. So we can get our time of uh, we can get our time of flight measurement in in a virtual clock that will drift at in the in within the anchor and the tag. Uh, now we have a problem. The last problem is that we want in our application to have the location in the copter. So we want all the information in the copter to measure the location. And here's the last timestamp is in the anchor, in the system. So we just add a force packet. So the current implementation uh, transmits all these three timestamps in the force packet. And so out of the six timestamps, the copter can calculate time of flight to the anchor, and we know the distance to the single anchor. Uh, and it's bidirectional communication, and the copter can choose a rate and can choose to with which anchor to range, which is nice because we can imagine some optimization when you would have a system in this room, a system in the room beside here, and you choose to with which anchor you want to range when you leave the room and want to go to the other room. So when we have distances, uh, we can place ourselves uh, in a sphere around the anchor. We range with multiple anchor, there is multiple sphere, and we will be at the intersection. So that's how we um, calculate our position. Uh, this behaves quite nicely. It works, um, it works well even if we leave the vicinity of the anchors. So um, even, even though here we will have a setup in, this, in, a, in some kind of a cube here, we can go away, it's still going to work OK. Um, Though there is a drawback, if you want to do swarm research, for example, if you want to fly a lot of, uh, a lot of your copters, uh, each tag will have to communicate with the anchor. 
which means that each tag will have to synchronize with each other to not communicate at the same time. You will have to share the air. And so that doesn't scale really well when you want to add new tags. Uh, we've been able to run four, I think. We certainly could run 10 with some optimization, copters with system, but we cannot run 50 or 100. It's not just not scaling. So one solution is to instead uh, look at time different arrival. So that's very similar to how GPS is working. That's why you don't need more bandwidth in GPS system each time you produce in GPS. And what you do is that you only listen. And uh, if we imagine that the anchors will be able to send the signal exactly at the same time, we could just listen at when the packet arrives. And the difference of time of arrival will give us a difference of distance between the anchor. We'll be able to know that we are 13 centimeters closer to anchor one than anchor two. Uh, now, this is not, it is not possible to send all packets at the same time. That's not going to work, so we just define time slots. Uh, anchors sends in their time slot, and we just subtract the time slot when we want to do the time different arrival. But now we have a problem because these anchors they are independent radios. They have independent clocks. They need to be synchronized together and they, so that we, we can synchronize this time slot and we can know how long time it took between two packets to be transmitted to be able to measure accurately the difference of time of arrival. And luckily, we can do that with two way ranging. So the idea is that this packet, they are broadcasted. Everyone's receiving it. And so even the anchors are receiving it. And we, we recognize here the double ping we saw before, which will allow us to uh, measure time of flight between two anchors. And if we have time of flight between two anchors, we know uh, uh, if we have time of flight between the anchor one and two, and we know when anchor one received the packet from anchor two, we can calculate when what time it was in anchor one when anchor two packet has been sent. And this will, will allow us to synchronize all the system and to measure uh, different time of arrival uh, between all the anchors. Once we have different time of arrival, we, then we know how close we are to an anchor towards another one. And it will place us in a parabola in space, in between the two anchors, uh, or parabola with is called in 3D. Uh, this works nicely when you are within the anchor space. So as they call, they, we call that the convex hole from, formed by the anchor. So that's the space that is enclosed by the, your anchor system. Then you get similar performance and with two-way ranging. Uh, the problem is that it degrades very, very quickly when you get away. And I mean, we can see that here, that if you would be here, you have an intersection of the two parabola, which is very shallow. So a little noise will mean a very big uncertainty in your um, position. So this case really well. Once you have managed to, to range one copter with that, you can range 100 copter. It doesn't matter because the copter only listen to the information that are broadcasted in the air and can calculate its own position. But yeah, we have a um, more constraint of how you can use it. You really have to rig the room. You have to put anchors all around. Your, uh, your space. Uh, so, the, the system we did out of this radio, what we call the local positioning system, uh, is based on the DVM-1000. Uh, we intend it as an open source local positioning system for robotic, any kind of robotic. Uh, since we're making a flying platform, we start with that. So that's our focus currently, to make it work as well as possible uh, with the crazy fly. Uh, but we don't forget all the robotic, and uh, we, intend it, we intend to make it useful for anyone that wants to locate something in real time. Uh, we've made two pieces of hardware uh, for this system. One is what we call the node. That's our anchor that we have here. Uh, the reason why we don't call it anchor is that it's basically an ultra-band radio with a processor and open source firmware. So it could be used as a tag, it could be used as a sniffer. Uh, it's really nice as a debug tool as well. So, um, so yeah. Um, 
and yeah. And the second piece of hardware is uh, is a deck for the Crazy Fly. So this is just the radio connected to the CPU of the Crazy Fly. The Crazy Fly is uh, calculating its position using uh, using its main CPU using the firmware. And uh, and yeah, all ranging, all control is implemented by the Crazy Fly. Then. So. To, to range, we needed to make some firmware, obviously, uh, for the crazy fly, for the anchor. Right now, we have two wear engine working. We consider it stable, it's working fairly well. Uh, TDOA, we consider very experimental. We had it working. We had flown uh, uh, five copter in our lab. It tends to do strange things every now and then, so that's still in progress. It's published, though, it's all open source, so if anyone wants to uh, poke in it. Um, but we also discovered that there is, I mean, we knew about it, but we discovered it even more, that there is more than just ranging into making local positioning system. Uh, one of these, the very important piece was a uh, sense of fusion algorithm. So we use a Kalman filter. And the reason is that the, the measurements you get from the system are very noisy. Um, we've been flying with them, raw measurement directly, but you get a very unstable flight, and it's not very nice to look at. It's not very useful. So, but luckily we have inertial sensor in the crazy flight, that's how it flies. So we can use this inertial sensor to get an idea on how we are moving in short period of time. Uh, this inertial measurement will tend to drift very quickly. You can get a couple of seconds of it and then you will, uh, your estimated position will drift way too much compared to your real position. So what the, the, the sensor fusion uh, algorithm will do is that it will fuse these two uh, measurement. Inertial measurement, which are very good for short term, but will tend to drift in long term. Ultra band measurement, which are very stable over long term. You can uh, uh, integrate them and you will, give, you will get pretty good measurement that's not going to drift. But in short term, they are almost useless because they are very noisy. And this has helped us to get much better performance. Uh, and we, I also discovered that a lot of work was needed in trajectory control. Apparently, it's not good enough to just tell the copter be here and just move by moving the set point. Uh, you, need the, you need to do it cleverly, and you need to make it uh, follow a trajectory. So that has been developed a lot recently as well, and it uh, increased a lot the um, smoothness of the flight and uh, how it behaves, the performance, more generally. Uh, Software-wise, so on the PC, uh, we... We've started implementing system with ROS. ROS is a robotic operating system. It's not an operating system, it's a framework. It's a robotic framework that uh, is used by a lot of researchers around the world in robotics, and that gives you a lot of basic pieces to work with robotics, like 3D visual visualizer and uh, debug tools. So it was really nice to work with, and it fits also our first target, which are uh, researchers in robotics. Um, but we are actually currently working at uh, supporting the system with the CrazyFly lib that already exists. We already have a Python lib and Python client to control the CrazyFly. And this will allow to set up the system much more easily and then you don't need uh, to have, I mean, ROS needs a specific version of Ubuntu and it's fairly hard to get, uh, to get around it and to learn how to use it. So we intend to make it easier to use. Um, and also, we intend to make it easier to set up. Uh, here, we had to be very careful about where we put the, the anchors and carefully measuring their position. It would be nice if we could just push a button and everything is set up and all the anchors know where they are. After all, they are ranging radios, so they could find their own position as well. Um, so, uh, We've been releasing the system about six months ago in what we call early access, which means that we tested the hardware, uh, but the software was very, very much work in progress. Uh, people have been getting it anyway, uh, starting to work with it. Uh, universities and industries have been using it to do research and uh, tech demo and this kind of things. Um, we also had a lot of interest by tech artists like to do light show or to, uh, yeah, using to do shows, more generally. That we were a bit, we knew there was a need, but we were a little bit surprised about the amount of people that would like to have a flying platform uh, to do shows. 
So uh, that would be a lot of fun, actually, to, to see that uh, coming. And yes, we have yeah, always a lot of ideas, a lot, lots of software that uh, needs to be done. Uh, uh, Marco Tempest, it's a um, tech uh, illusionist, He's been uh, he's been making a Blender choreography plugin for uh, yeah a Blender plugin for making choreography for flying platforms. So ba basically, you make a choreography, you export CSV, and then you have a playback tool, which will be a swarm management software. It's a nice name for it uh, to broadcast this to your copter and follow the choreography you have set up. Uh, and also, we, as I said, working a lot about, uh, on easing the uh, setup, like uh, automat autonom automatic anchor position measurements. Um, yes, and to, to support general, more general robotics, we're planning on making a small tag with IMU. So, yeah, basically a crazy fly without the wing, without the 2.4 gigahertz radio, but with ultra band radio that you could just hook up to your existing robot and get XYZ. Or even GPS-like uh, cell data if you, if you would like to retrofit on an existing robot. So that's some things we, uh, we are looking at for the future. And so, yeah, I, I'm personally very interested by that. The, this system will, um, will allow more university, more research lab, more people to access local positioning because it is 10 to 1 at times less expensive than uh, these motion capture systems uh, that were state-of-the-art for doing this kind of research so far. It's less precise, but it's good enough for a lot of use case. But it's still out of reach for uh, hobbyist hackers. I mean, it's still a bit on the expensive side. S but all the software that has been developed, all the sense of fusion, trajectory control, all that, will allow this attempt to work much better. With sense of fusion, we can lose one second of image, and it still flies. So all this camera base, webcam base, uh, will be able to work much, much better now that we have all the software in place and that we've kind of state-of-the-art algorithms in the crazy fly. So I'm hoping at coming back at that and allowing anyone to, to do autonomous flight uh, with a crazy fly without having to have to set up a uh, local positioning system at home. So that's the dangerous part. Oh yeah, thank you. I was actually... Uh, yeah, that's not going to work out. So yeah, that's a wanted position of the anchors. So we have six anchors, two here, two here, and two on the front. So it's kind of prison. Uh, and that's what our normal client looks like. So we are not gooey people. So what I'm doing is that I'm starting the crazy fly facing X. We have X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's important because it has to know its initial orientation. It can, it can correct its orientation with the uh, sense of fusion algorithm, but it, you need a good initial orientation. And uh, yes, I need to connect it. Here. I don't know if you see, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, as was meant with dev for development, we have this log subsystem that allows to log a lot of values from the crazy fly. And that is the distance to the anchor. So if I move around, for example, that's a bad one. The red one here is going to, no, it's a pink one that's going low. And we also see some outliers. So that's the distance to all the anchor I have set up uh, in my system. And so last week we've had a position hold. So if I press this button, yes. So now it's trying to keep its, posi its uh, velocity. So it's some kind of velocity control. There is some drift due to a, a bug in the common feature. But basically, I can control the velocity of the platform. And I can make it move as const constant velocity and just break. But 
So that's what we can do so far with our client, still work in progress. But so, with uh, ROS that we've been using for much longer for this system, that doesn't seem to work. Oh yeah, I know why. There it is. So you can, see, I don't know if it's, you can see, but yes, here I have a 3D visualization of my space. And we can see the crazy flight that is uh, this, uh, this axis in, in, uh, in the middle. So I can just move my set point, take off, and move. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, not touching. Yeah, I'm not completely getting used to it, it's really nice. So that has been working for months now, and now I can try to show what has been working for days. <laughs> um, we've had a lot of contact recently with a uh, university called ETH Zurich. Uh, Mike Hammer over there has been doing a lot of algorithms. He has been doing the current feature, and recently he's been um, uh, making a nonlinear controller, which is apparently a much better controller. And we've had student uh, Marcus Griff here from uh, Loon University that's been doing uh, trajectory planning. So the idea is that here I had a set point, and I could move the set point around. But we've been trying, for example, to make circle it behaves really badly because the copter gets late, then tries to catch up then it's too early, and then it stops, and you, you get a very, uh, very bad trajectory. Uh, what we're doing here instead is that we pre-calculate uh, velocity and position and acceleration, and we feed that to the platform. So we tell the crazy fly what velocity, what acceleration it should reach to follow the trajectory. And this should result in much better trajectory control. So let's Oh yeah, and I. Yes, this is what we're supposed to do. Um, so yes, very briefly, we have an ellipse. Then we, would sh we should go back and forth, and then we should have a spiral. So let's try. So that's the ellipse. Yes, power was cool, we made it two times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's all, I think. So, sometimes no question. Oh, right. Can, well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's the point. So the question is that uh, it, it, since we are using radio, it's uh, 
what about directionality of the antennas, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're, we're using the Decarive module here that uses a cheap antenna. And yes, there, there, is a, there is some effect of directionality. So if I would, um, actually I could, if I would make it turn. Oh. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay. So if I would make it turn, it starts. This controller is awesome because it managed to keep its, uh, its stability even if you do uh, very like, I have not been able to crush it yet. But anyway, <laughs> okay, I'm having too much fun now. But anyway, <laughs> the, the key is that, yeah, we get, I attribute that to directionality of the antenna. I think we, we are not turning uh, on the same point because uh, we get a di um, yeah, we get different position because of tur just turning. So that I guess is things that you might be able to account for if you know if you know your system and you calibrate for it. So is it just a single receiver? It's just a single receiver, a single antenna, and this antenna will have different propagation delay uh, depending of the. Uh, we have a small errors depending of where the signal comes from. Yeah, it's a shame that you get a small error from both systems. Sorry. It could, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, it has to pass a pop, yeah. Could have an effect when the signal has to pass through the motors, for example. Yeah. Yes? Uh, can you give an indication of the precision accuracy of the motor processing? Yeah, so the question is that uh, about the accuracy. Uh, we expect plus minus 10 centimeter of uh, 3D accuracy. Uh, it has been done, but I'm not sure about the result exactly. Yeah. So it's in the order, it has been done with Vicon system, and it's in the order 10 centimeters XY. We have a little bit more problem with that. Uh, so we have been starting selling this setup, mm -hmm. so everything, the radio, the copter, and uh, the system for 1,000 euros. So that's, yeah. So that's why, yeah. That's why, I mean, it's, it's very affordable for universities. Uh, for hobbies, it's a little bit steep. So that's why I'm, I have some interest also uh, uh, making it work with the webcam and stuff like that. Yes? Uh, if you want to easily source the chip, it is the one. Uh, I know that there is other chip available that have been used, but they are not standard and they are not so uh, widespread. It's not so easy to source. Well, okay. Okay, thank you.